There has never been a beer that has left the sensory department that I thought was not the best thing that we could be giving to the public at that time. So we just care a lot about consistency and just having really good, high quality, drinkable beer. And the people that work here are all really awesome. It's a really fun team and they're so smart and <laughs> I learn so much every day. That was Chelsea from Firestone Walker on this week's episode of Brew Roots. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Brew Roots, where we tell the stories behind your favorite beer. This is Sound Guy Ryan, and joining me, as always, is Erica and Matt. Yeah, we are here today, and we are keeping warm, thanks to our friends over at Shirts on Tap, because we have new hoodies. Oh, yeah. Yeah, major shout out to Josh, who uh, hooked us up with some amazing hoodies. Uh, some sweet swag. Yeah, you and know. if you aren't linked up with Shirts on Tap, you need to. Do it. Because they've made some awesome products for us. And if you're a brewery that's looking to get on board with them. They have amazing deals for you guys, too. Like, their monthly shirts thing, they don't charge you. Yeah, it's awesome. You just sign up and make some amazing art and get some free publicity. It's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Actually, this month is uh, Neil from Gilded Skull. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, I'm very excited. Pretty excited. Yeah, and yeah. along with that, they have the whole beer merch thing. <laughs> Um, and this oh, month they they're swag, doing yeah. the um, uh, drink mass beer, uh, ma- uh, drink mass made beer. Uh, it's shirt. mass beer week. It's mass, mass beer, beer week. week. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's super cool. Um, I pre-ordered mine. I also pre-ordered one for one of my friends uh, for a birthday gift. That's um, nice. And it's really cool because you really see where the armpit of Massachusetts is. <laughs> um, <laughs> and who actually has seen the design? You know what? Use your own opinion, but now cool, you actually cool. know where the armpit of mass is. But yeah. no, it, it's a really cool shirt. I like it a lot. Yeah, absolutely. For sure, for sure. I actually uh, I got the the hop beard tea as oh, well with that because I, I I didn't I actually hadn't looked at the beer merch. Uh, they have website. some great merch yeah. there. But for sure. the awesome thing about the the mass beer week shirt is that it it goes back similar to the the drink mass beer. Yep, all um, the proceeds go right back to um, the Mass Brewers Guild, yeah. which they honestly kind of probably desperately need right now because again it's covid and we are not having any festivals so yeah. they aren't making any money from anything right now yeah absolutely and we've we've unfortunately heard of, of a couple closures in our area uh going on um cape ann brewing company in gloucester uh mass they've been around for 18 years and they're shutting so door. crazy yeah, yeah. um which so is, is which is a bummer going. because they've been on our list for a while to get them on and, yeah um i'd love to still talk with them just because of the knowledge yeah. that's been uh you know, throughout that door, you know, and people who sure. work there, I'm sure they're, they're, I'm sure they're interspersed yeah. throughout. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the other thing is, is we heard that Night Shift Lovejoy um, location is going to be closing. Just uh, temporarily, temporarily. Not, not um, forever, but I'm sure they're not getting a whole lot of business being in Boston, Boston right yeah. now. And there's no, well, sports, but you can't attend them. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah. tough. Uh, so, you know, hats off to those people. I, I'm, I hope to see you on the other side. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, there's some cool beer news going around though right now. I mean, we're seeing a lot of cool um, limited releases of beer. Yeah, no, um, definitely. Um, we've been trying to share as many as we can without inundating all of you people. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, make sure to follow our, us um, and follow Mass Beer Bros to uh, stay up to date on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, today I picked up a four pack of Bodega Juice from Spicket River. Delicious. And, and that's what we're drinking right now. Um, and people might actually cringe when they find out that I've been drinking a lot of New England IPAs. Maybe not cringe, but He's be shocked. He's going through a phase. Uh, yeah, shocked. Yeah. Yep. I support you in every way, <laughs> shape, or form. Yeah, um, they're good. <laughs> listen, I did not... <laughs> listen. They're not bad. They're not bad. There's a reason that they're the most popular. Right, right. right. Um, but this one's really This good. one's nice. Yeah. It's very clean. It's easy drinking. Um, what's the percentage on it? Uh... 6.5. 6. Yeah. It makes yeah. you say your. That's what it says on it. A juicy New England style IPA. This beer will make you say your. Your. Uh, here. Okay. Yeah, it's good. Um, <laughs> this is my second offering from Spicket River. And uh, actually, yeah, I've had a few I, of theirs. Yeah. And honestly, I, I've enjoyed all of them. Yeah. Yeah. And we're in talks to go uh, speak with them pretty soon. Yeah. So uh, stay tuned. Which, you is, guys. which is cool because. Uh, the Merrimack Valley, which is in our area, it's is, kind of blooming now. Yeah, it's, in yeah. a sense, we it have is. Uh, Oak and two. Iron. Yep. Well, there's no, well, there's Lowell. more. I mean, we have, have Lowell. Yeah, we have two in Merrimack Lowell. and Navigation, um, Spicket, and then, oh uh, yeah, Oak, Oak and, and Iron. Iron. Yeah. So, so all doing great things right now. Cool. Yeah. 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 Um, other than that, I've been drinking a lot of Jack's Abbey. 
a ton of. Well, you got that pride and park. Oh, what's he? Yeah, what do you have, Ryan? What you call it? So, so I can't think of. So yeah, so I I started my day off setting up for our interview. Uh, Stay tuned. It's a great interview. Solid. It's a little long. It's it's (laughs) the long. Um, so I started my day off with a, uh, Augustine, uh, 13 degree, uh, from Schilling it is the Politamave lager. So amazing. Um, and then I did the Schilling box style pale lager, mm. which is called all right, all Winter right. Hammer. Mm. Um, and then I finished off, uh, <laughs> with the elaborate metaphor, which is a new, uh, New England pale ale from Burlington Beer Co. Wonderful. Nice. Solid day for you there. It's yeah, a that is great cool. day. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. All I picked up at the city in Seabrook, New Hampshire. Ryan's oh. favorite, place. favorite place. My my fave. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I have been drinking is, yeah. is, is Jack's Abbey. I, I'm, solid, solid time. Solid. What about you? Um, just a bunch of odds and ends. Yeah. Just honestly trying to go through my beer my fridge beer and yeah. <laughs> get as much. On my days off, I, I just start drinking like at lunch. Yeah. And I try to drink like four beers a day on my days off. Yeah. <laughs> just so I can try to make a dent. Um, oh, it's so tough. It's tough. It's tough. But yeah, no, it's good. I mean, so I had a couple from Fort Hill. Um, what else did I have? Um, oh, I had some from Shovel Town. They're doing amazing beer. Yeah. Honestly. Um, if you can get it, I think they're delivering now as well. Um, so if you can get it, do it. Hey, Andy. How are you? It's ya? so good. Andy, we love you. <laughs> and the rest of the Shovel Town, Dan. Oh, of course. Of course. Um, but yeah. And then otherwise, outside of that, Pink Boots News, um, we have our first meeting of the year. Woohoo. Super exciting. Um, that is going to happen January 27th. So make sure you sign up and re sign up because I'm sure a lot of you guys have not. Because why would you sign up in 2020 when nothing's going on? I totally get it. But now it's 2021 and we have big plans. So come back and we will see you on January 27th for our first meeting on virtually. Yeah. Uh, also, if you follow us on social media across all platforms at Pru Roots, uh, Ryan and I. Erica, if you're, you're invited as well. Oh, okay, thanks. We'll be kegging our beer <gasps> that we brewed on our Claw Hammer yes. Supply uh, all-in-one system. I haven't had it yet, but every time you guys talk about it, it just sounds amazing. So just a reminder to our listeners, we brewed a mango hibiscus blonde. <sighs> and it's 3.2%? Question mark? Uh, Exclamation point? I, you know what? Uh, right now, I can't remember what it's supposed to be. No, it's 3.8%. Oh, it's 3.8%. 3. 3. 3. 8. 8. I was real close. But yeah, that's um, uh, beautiful. That's exactly what I want. Ryan and I checked it, and we hit our final gravity of 1.014. But beautiful. our hydrometer it really can't delineate that last decimal point. No, you really can't. So yeah. we're assuming. It's a guess. We're, we're close. <laughs> we're close. Um, but we're going to be doing something. We're going to try... Not it's called. I don't know if it's really called instantaneous carbonation. It's force carb. Force carbonation. Okay. We're gonna try force carbonation. Nice. Um, so if any of our listeners have any tips on force carbonation, we're doing it on Sunday. So this episode's getting released on a Friday. So send us a DM y- quick. Yeah. Yeah. Stat. <laughs> yeah. I've I've never force carbed anything. Um. You know. I I've always been in the school of being patient. Um, but a lot of people that I know who homebrew are always like impatient, like yeah. they're, they're <laughs> like super the impatient. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So they, they force carb. Um, and a lot of people have good results. Yep. I, I haven't heard a lot of people say, oh, you shouldn't do that. Yeah. You know, that regular carbonation, like waiting the time that you actually need to wait is mm. better. We're just super fortunate that we have the pump to do it. Yeah. So I think well, exactly. we have all the tools to do For it. Sure. I think the correct way. Um, and, and we're going to do a CO2 transfer as well. So we're, we're going to make sure that we don't have oxidated beer. Yeah. Which kind of brings us to the point of our episode because nobody wants oxidation no one wants in their beer. No oxidated beer. Oxygen in I beer. do. Gross. Oh, wait. No. <laughs> um, yeah. We teased it last week and we, we mentioned something called uh, retrograde. Retro nasal. Retro nasal. Yeah. Re- retro nasal. Mm, retro nasal. Um, and we, we, we spoke with Chelsea from Firestone Walker. You may yes. or may not have heard of them. You may or may not have heard of them. Um, indeed. But Chelsea's awesome. She's a, so cool. She's a former roller derby Ugh, extraordinaire. Yes. Which, so she's a total badass. Total badass. I mean, on top of just being in the beer industry. Yeah. And being a woman. So, yeah. Yeah, you know what? You're right. <laughs> you're right, you're right. Um, but I think this episode's awesome because we have been 
like people when we when we put up polls, what would you like to hear? People overwhelmingly want Always. to hear about uh, beer sensory, which uh, we get because honestly, so do we. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We we did the the surround course, and that and that touched on it slightly. But I mean, this person does this as a job. She does this every day, and it's a blessing and a burden, I think, for her because. <laughs> Like, As you will hear, um, it's it's ruined everything yeah. for her. I, guess, I mean, <laughs> it's awesome to know those flavors, but then when you try something... Now you can't like, not taste them, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you might have heard terms like diacetylus or something that tastes like buttered popcorn. Cardboard. Um, yeah. Uh, so we go into a lot of those off flavors in this episode, and uh, it's really cool because... I certainly learned a ton about this, and I think our listeners are going to learn a ton. And she gives you some really fun um, at-home projects to do to kind of find and understand what oxidized beer is and what other off-flavors are, um, which is really cool. So you can learn a a lot from this. And for me, uh, a lot of the methods that she gave was like a whole new way of trying beer. Yeah. Uh, Like retronasal, which you guys are going to learn about out there. Yeah. Um, we I do, do it that. all the time. I do now. it all the time. And it's more of a challenge to make sure. It I is. Can it do is. It. Yeah, it's yeah. like, can I do it? Yes, I nailed it. <laughs> or not. And then you just kind of, I don't know, you just breathe in your beard. It's gross and it's not good. But I anyways. Just, I just did it. I got a mango flavor. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, so. <laughs> oh, shit. I spilled my beer. <laughs> it's fine. Now, nah, Ryan looks really upset. Do you want to just wrap this up? <laughs> all right, we're going to wrap this up and get clean. <laughs> Cheers. Hey, we- we're going to have to. Hey everyone, we are here with Chelsea of Firestone Walker, and we're super excited. Yeah, the plane ride was non-existent, but my arms are <laughs> tired. We flew there. Yeah, my arms yeah. are tired. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm so excited because I really like your beer. <laughs> yeah, this is a huge brewery. So yeah. yeah, and the cool thing about this episode is, as amazing as the beer is there. We're going to talk about why their beer is so amazing. Kind of behind the scenes. Yeah. And I think a lot of times we talk about important things in beer, like consistency. We use words like consistency. We use words. We consistently use the word consistently. Yeah. What other words do we use? We use words like uh, flavor profile and mouthfeels and... and Off flavors. Off flavors. And then... Someone will ask me at my favorite brewery, can you taste X ox flavor or something? <laughs> and they're usually a brewer, Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I will say, no, this beer just tastes great because of the people I'm around. But yes. I think um, the way that we can educate our listeners, and when I say our listeners, it's like We're me really saying talking like, about us. Yeah, it's like yeah. me saying like, oh, I have a friend who has this issue. No, I don't know anything about this. So Chelsea, you're here to educate us today our listeners well thank you so much for having me yeah so the way we start our podcast is we ask every guest their role at the respective brewery that they work at and their first memory of beer all right um so i am one half of the sensory team here at firestone walker so i am a sensory technician and i work alongside craig thomas who is the sensory research analyst and we both work very closely with amy crook who is the quality manager so we're part of the qc lab Um, my first beer memory, um, my dad was a big early craft beer drinker. So probably sipping a Sam Adams or something along those lines, uh, early nineties as a little kid, probably hated it at the time. Definitely uh, (laughs) didn't have more than one sip, but definitely set me on that path. Yeah. Um, Obviously, you said it set you on that path. Did you want to go into the beer QC world, or are you like a biologist by trade, by education? No, I'm not actually. Um, so I always love hearing how people get, got into the beer industry because there's so many different paths that people take. Yeah. Um, so for me, I spent all of my 20s working in bars and restaurants in the Seattle area. Um, and Seattle obviously has an amazing craft beer scene. So I was really fortunate to be just surrounded by really good beer that entire time, like from the time I turned 21. Um, and as time went on, I moved up in the world to be a restaurant manager and it turned out that my favorite part of that was being a beer buyer. Um, and so by that point in my career, I was really going to a lot of beer events, um, getting more into beer education, starting to study to become a certified Cicerone. And it just kind of happened naturally. Um, So 2016 was a really good year. I turned 30. I got married, 
I moved to California <laughs> and at that Woo-hoo! point, um, <laughs> since I was going to be looking for a job, I decided to really focus in on um, the beer industry specifically. So I started working at a little brewery in San Francisco called Bear Bottle. Um, and that <clears throat> kind of just kicked off from there. Um, the Pink Boots Society is really active in the Bay Area. So Ooh, shout out. yeah, major <laughs> shout out to them. Um, so there was just kind of no limit of educational opportunities and social events. And yeah, it just really expanded from there. Um, so then in 2018, I moved to the Central Coast and started working at Firestone Walker. I actually got into the company in the logistics department, which we call beer traffic control. So, <laughs> I, was a, so I was a beer traffic controller, um, and I handled our shipments to the East Coast, Hawaii, and international markets. Um, but once I started working here at Firestone, I joined the sensory panel pretty quickly. Um, I'd already taken some off flavor courses in the Bay Area. So I had some tasting experience. Mm. Um, did you take those as a part of Pink Boots or did you just take those on your own? Um, kind of a mixture. Um, I'm trying to remember now because I took several courses from Nicole Ernie, who was a Pink Boots member. Um, she's a Master Cicerone. I believe she was 21 when she became a Master Cicerone. Wow. So she's just like this incredibly Damn. smart person in beer. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so I definitely took one course from her that I think was just part of SF Beer Week. And then actually Bear Bottle hired her to do some staff trainings as well. So I did some off flavor training at that brewery. Mm. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, once I joined the sensory panel here at Firestone, my education definitely accelerated because we do so many trainings. Um, and then I got invited to join a subgroup of sensory panel that's called the descriptive panel that used to meet in person. Now we meet virtually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but it's generally like round table tastings, um, more advanced training, mm. new product development discussions, things like that. Okay. Um, so sensory very quickly became my favorite part of the day. <laughs> I love <loved> joining <laughs> the panel. I would just be like the first one in line when they'd open up panel. And so um, last year was a really good year for my beer career. I became a certified Cicerone. Mm-hmm. And then almost exactly the same time, the person who had been working as the sensory tech um, switched positions and the role became open. And so I jumped right on it and switched departments. Cool. So That's awesome. So yeah. you've, you've kind of seen all sides of the business. As a <laughs> yeah, whole, right? So um, being there right now and knowing, you know, off flavors and sensory like that um in a nutshell what does that role actually like entail entail yeah Yeah, so like what's like the too long didn't read version of your role (laughs) yeah so um being part of the qc department obviously sensory is kind of one of the last checks we do on a product before it goes out to market um because before it reaches sensory it's already been tested hundreds and hundreds of times um, throughout the brewing and fermentation process and packaging process. So we're just kind of the last line to make sure that the product is consistent, that it's true to brand. Um, the majority of what we do is product release panels where we're just having our tester, our tasters um, assess the beer and make sure that it fits the parameters of what we want that particular brand to taste like. Um, we also use sensory to develop um, shelf shelf life profiles for the beers. So we taste them as they age and kind of develop the standard for what point is too old for that particular brand because it definitely varies depending on the style of the beer. Um, We also have an education component where we train new employees and then ongoing training for our sales team. And we also help with research and development. So whenever we have a new product coming down the pipeline, we'll through multiple test batches of it, run it through panel, get people's feedback. Nice. So, well, yeah. That's well, a lot. Yeah. Well, you, <laughs> you, you, you answered all my questions. Interview yeah. over. No, no. Um, so I guess, you know, I think often flavor profiles or off flavors that we hear is, oh, it's oxidated. It tastes like cardboard. Or we have diacetyl and it tastes like p- popcorn. Butter popcorn. Yeah, butter yeah. popcorn. Um, are those subtle flavors? You know, if someone has that, I mean, I think you know, oh, it tastes like butter or this tastes like cardboard but can you do you have a better palate as a result of looking for those do you 
do you not enjoy beer as much because now you're <laughs> looking for those? Actually, yeah. Uh, knowing a lot about sensory is a double-edged sword because um, <laughs> once you have learned how to identify those flavors, you can't really turn off that part of your brain. So yep. I'm a total pain in the ass to go drinking <laughs> with. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a beer. I take one sip. My husband looks at me like, oh, what's wrong with it? Like, do we need to trade? <laughs> So a lot of it is just practice, really. Um, and it's just repetition and exposure to more flavors and aromas and making the connections in your brain to remember um, what the aroma is. And yeah, once you start to identify it, you will be ruined. <laughs> yeah. What are the um, best ways you found to learn sensory? Again, just like drinking, like any of those test packs um, with the different flavors in them or? Yeah, there's a lot of different ways. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and plug that on the Firestone Walker blog. We actually just had a post that came out from the sensory department about um, right. off flavors, off flavor training at home. Cool. Um, nice. Because, you know, they do make a lot of off flavor kits and those are really great, but there is so much you can do without investing the money in that and just using things that you have around your house. Um, some of the things we suggest in that blog are, um, intentionally leaving the beer exposed to sunlight to skunk it. Um, that's free. <laughs> um, you can also, um, intentionally age the beer rapidly at home, which this one I think is really fun. And this is when I need to specify my version of fun is not everyone's version of fun. <laughs> like, yay, you can intentionally make your beer taste gross. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you can take a six pack and, you can make this as simple or complicated as you want. Um, simple version would be to just take one can of beer and keep it in the trunk of your car for a week and then taste it side by side with a, a can from the same six pack that you've kept in your fridge. So then you'll be able to tell the effects of just one week of hot, cold temperature fluctuation and how much that will abuse the beer. Yep. If you want to get fancy with it, you can stagger it and put a couple beers into your car like one week apart. So then you'll have like a three week warm store, a two week warm store, a one week warm store, and then your uh, three week cold store to compare against. Um, but you can also just get a lot of sensory experience just being mindful anytime you're eating and drinking or even just walking around. Like we have a shrub outside the brewery that we have noticed smells like isovaleric acid, which is like, oh. <laughs> um, it's an aroma that can come from hops, especially if the hops are a little bit old and it smells like stinky feet or cheese. And oh, so, yeah, yeah, you can just experience these things out in the world because these flavor compounds exist in things besides beer. Um, so awareness, just, keeping your nose <laughs> open. Um, Who knew? And, yeah. And just repetition and practice. Definitely. Yeah. Um, get in the habit that when you crack a beer, don't just go straight into chugging it, you know, actually look at it, um, swirl it, sniff it, give it a full assessment before you start just mindlessly sipping at it. And what is the full assessment in your opinion? <laughs> Yeah, so there is actually um, a standard tasting technique, and I really like showing this to people because um, depending on the flavors in the beer, it can be pretty dramatic to notice um, which aromas come out at which point in the, the assessment process. So basically, when you're properly tasting a beer, um, ideally you're using a proper beer glass and it's not full to the brim so that you can really agitate the beer in the glass. Um, so this is going to be hard to do without visual. <laughs> but <laughs> it's okay. Essentially, you're going to hold the beer in your hand and you're going to start agitating it. Um, generally, like people do counterclockwise. Yep, you're going to do a counterclockwise swirl. Um, and then the first sniff is called a drive-by sniff. And so you're going to just kind of hold the, pass the beer under your nose, a few inches under your nose. Um, and just bring it closer and closer to your face until you smell something, anything at all. And that's generally going to be a sulfur that you smell first. Um, then you're going to keep swirling, 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 swirling. <laughs> then you're going to bring the beer up to your nose and do a shorter sniff, like a one second sniff. Um, you're going to go back to swirling some more. <laughs> you're going to bring it back <laughs> up to your nose again for a two second sniff or a long sniff. And then finally, you're going to put your hand over the rim of the glass to try to form a tight seal swirl some more and then with the glass right next to your face you're going to pull your hand away and let those captured aromas go up into your nose um, and you'll notice that 
there are compounds that maybe you won't smell at all until you get to that very last covered sniff. Um, so you're so almost like training your nose to pick up things, pick up things yeah. along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, that's all just before you've even put the beer in your mouth. Right? <laughs> <all> yeah. <laughs> um, people don't realize it's not even really so much about drinking. It's mostly about sniffing. Hmm. Before we get into some of the methods of tasting the beer, we do just have a quick <laughs> word from our amazing sponsor. So take it away, sound guy, Ryan. Did you know that your favorite Massachusetts breweries use hops from a local family-owned hop farm right here in Massachusetts? Our friends over at Four Star Farms are there for you whether you're a commercial brewery or a small batch home brewer. Make sure to head over to their website today and get your hands on some of the best and freshest hops available locally. Cheers. Cheers. At our local homebrew shop, Beer and Wine Hobby, you can get everything you need to make beer, wine, cider, cheese, and more. Not sure where to start? They have knowledgeable staff there to help. Beer and Wine Hobby is family owned and located in Danvers, Massachusetts. Visit their website, beer-wine.com, and use our promo code BRUITS for 10% off your online order today. Shirks on Tap is the box subscription service where you can get some of the dopest brewery t-shirts out there. I'm talking breweries from Dallas, San Diego, and even our home area of New England. And you might ask, how do I get my hands on some? To get your first box for $5, click the link below in our description, or head on over to our website, breweries.com. Remember, drink better beer, wear better shirts. And we're back. So Chelsea, you were talking about, you said it's not so much about tasting the beer. It's, it's a lot of sniffing. Sm- sniffing. Yeah. <laughs> but mm-hmm. I'm sure you do have to taste it to get some of those flavors and, and, and sensory. Uh, what's some methods that you use uh, tasting wise? Yeah. So um, after you've done all the swirling and all the sniffing, <laughs> you're finally ready to actually taste the beer. Yay. So you're just going to take a normal sip and... Just make sure that the beer makes contact with all the different parts of your tongue, um, and then swallow normally. And then one thing that's a little bit hard to explain to people, especially without being seen, um, <laughs> you're going to then do another type of sniffing while you're exhaling. So you're going to take a sip of your beer, and then as you're swallowing the beer, you're going to breathe out through your nose, um, and that's called retronasal. And so that's going to allow you to basically use scent receptors to smell what was in the back of your throat, if that makes Ooh. sense. Interesting. Um, so never... there are other flavors that will only come out during the retronasal that you didn't get in the orthonasal, which is normal sniffing into your nose. I'm learning so much. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think of how I swallow and I know, right? That's what I was just <laughs> <laughs> Without getting beer up and through my nose. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say um, I spill a lot of beer when I'm tasting. Yeah. I definitely have accidentally sniffed the beer up my nose before. So <laughs> good to know because yeah. that's happening. Yeah, yeah. we're, we're going to try all of these after. Um, so uh, there's other sensory as well. So I'm sure looking at the beer or is is part of it. Is part of it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And really the visual assessment is the first piece because you're going to get a lot of clues from that. You know, it doesn't have foam. Does it not have foam? Is it clear? Is it supposed to be clear? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, and especially when we're doing product release, like true to brand type testing, that's really important. Yeah. So let's go into that. Yeah, for thing, sure. Maybe. Yeah. So how do you test... I mean, you're testing all of your beers, right? And so I, the core beer is you're testing constantly to make sure they're all consistent. Um, what goes into that? And then what happens if it's not consistent? Do you just dump it? Do you maybe brand it as a different beer? Definitely haven't done that before. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, so basically the way that we run product release here is that we test every batch from each bright tank. Um, so... Whether it's going to be packaged into cans, kegs, bottles, it might be packaged into all three of those formats off of the same bright tank. But in that case, we would only test it once. Um, So we're tasting every batch. Um, When panelists come in, they are presented with a warm-up beer and a water glass. And then I slide them a tray of eight samples of beer. 
they know what the brand is, but that's it. Um, and we do all of this on a computer system. It's a proprietary software that we developed here. That's just Shh, got, <laughs> it's got, uh, you know, every, every possible aroma, visual descriptor that you could want. So that as the panelists are going through, they're looking at each sample and they're saying like, okay, this is an 805. Does it look like an 805? Does it have yeah. the right foam to be an 805? Yeah. Does it have the right aroma? Does it have the right taste? And does it have the right mouthfeel? And then the last question is, is it true to brand? Um, so, you know, it's up to the panelist's discretion if they detect something um, that seems at a higher level than normal, but isn't necessarily unpleasant, they can mark that. So for example, with 805, which is our um, Honey Blondale, they might note that there's a higher than normal amount of isoamyl acetate, which is a banana flavor, kind of like banana runs. Mm -hmm. um, but that wouldn't be a reason to not release it because that's just a naturally occurring, like pleasant taste. In that so style they can, of beer. They can mark that. Yeah. yeah, so they can mark that and then still pass the sample. Um, but then we're also looking for major defects. You know, is there something going wrong with this batch? And so if over 20% of our panelists flag something as a treated brand fail, um, then we have kind of this whole decision tree that we follow. We'll have um, different options depending on what the panelist's feedback was. So, for instance, if 85% of panelists say this has acetaldehyde, then um, we're going to be pretty sure that that's <laughs> a consensus. Yep. Um, we will test other packages from the same bright tank if they exist. So, for example, if we've run a keg through sensory panel and the keg failed, but there were also bottles from the same batch. We'll try those two and see if we get the same result to try to narrow down, like, was this a packaging problem? Was it a problem with the entire batch? Um, and so ultimately it gets kind of escalated um, depending on the panel results. And ultimately it's a manager's decision of what to do. Um, in the time that I have been running sensory panel, we really have not had any, um, what I would say, like a show stopping problem. So no tank um, dumps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have not had recalls or tank dumps or anything like that. So mm -hmm. knock on wood. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So some guy Ryan has a question and he can't unfortunately be in the interview. I have to read it through text. <laughs> triangle tests. Yes. Um, triangle tests are kind of the bread and butter of sensory science when you're trying to determine um, similarity and differences between products. Um, so the way a triangle test works, um, for example, we used that recently when we were trying to determine if our panelists could tell a difference between Mind Haze IPA brewed with two and a half pounds per barrel of dry hop versus two pounds per barrel of dry hop. Oh, so in that case, um, they're presented with three samples of the beer and they're just asked which one is different mm. and they don't know what what Why the premise is generally yeah. Yeah. It's, it's usually kept pretty blind um and they're told you must choose one even if you're guessing um and then yeah there's a formula to determine whether or not you have a statistical significance are there any off flavors that beer drinkers should be concerned about tasting um if they do find themselves drinking a beer and they say oh this just doesn't taste right well i mean i don't think there's any that are necessarily going to be a health risk um so yeah. it's definitely a matter of preference and palate um the most common one that you're going to encounter out in the wild as i always say is <laughs> just going to be aging there's so many aging characteristics that once you learn to identify those you're um, screwed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'll be like me where you never buy a six pack without checking the dates of every single package in the store. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, what would some of those characteristics be? Um, so the most common would be um, like a papery or wet cardboard aroma, which also can be kind of waxy, almost like chapstick. So okay. um, depending on the style of beer, if it's a heavily hopped beer, um, the hops are going to drop out pretty rapidly and just lose a lot of the fresher flavors. Um, if it's a maltier beer to begin with or a sweeter beer, it's going to get probably cloyingly sweet because mm. the sweetness will really get amplified. Um, there's a compound called damascanone, which is kind of like raisins or dried fruit. Um, and that one actually can be a positive attribute depending on the beer. Like it's in a lot of barrel aged beers. Right. And yeah. um, 
but not so much in an IPA. That's tough. A lot of those flavors, you know, they're good in some beers, bad in other beers, like styled of beers. Um, yeah. Makes it kind of difficult <laughs> to, yeah, absolutely. to figure out. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned, I am curious though, with your products being shipped throughout the country, um, we hear it on a local level of, you know, brewers who are, you know, not semi-professional. They're, they're professional brewers. They just don't have a brick and mortar location and they're hand distributing their products. And it's so disheartening to see, you know, they have their double IPA, New England style IPA, and then you see it on a shelf and you know that that beer style is supposed to be in the refrigerator. Um, people getting your beer out here, I've seen your beer on the shelf. I'm sure that breaks your heart to hear. Or does that even matter? Yeah, I mean, does that do even matter? Do you think it matters if it's on a shelf or in refrigeration? It does matter, unfortunately. Um, okay. <laughs> I do wish that every bottle shop in the world could afford the space and refrigeration to keep everything cold, but I know that in the real world, unfortunately, that's not always how it happens. Um, for Firestone, we do make sure to maintain cold chain all the way to the point of distribution. So all of our shipments are refrigerated. Um, it's part of our contract with distributors that they will agree to keep our beer under certain proper conditions. Um, but yeah, once it gets out to retail, unfortunately, we lose a lot of the control over the product. How long do you think um, is kind of the time frame when it's like this beer's been sitting here for a week or a month or, or whatever, and it's like we got to get that off the shelf? Um, well, it's definitely going to depend on the brand and the style. Yeah. So uh, that's one of the things that we do with establishing shelf life um, because you know, a heavily hopped beer is going to show age much faster than, for example, a stout. Yeah. Um, so for me personally, I'm pretty sensitive to flavors of aging. So personally, I wouldn't buy a beer that was more than three months old. Okay. But I think for the average consumer, a three month old cold stored beer is going to taste perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> right. And what if it wasn't cold stored? Uh, then it's a exponentially faster process yeah. of degradation. <laughs> so um, maybe one tenth as much time as if it were cold stored. <laughs> wow. Holy okay. Cow. Yep. <laughs> That's kind of what I thought. Before we get into looking at how you guys develop new recipes and your your involvement in that new recipe, we do just want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. Take it away. Please. Are you a solo artist, band, podcaster, or anyone else who needs recording services? Well, we got a place for you where your vision can become a reality. Welcome to Small Pond Studios, built by hand with heart and sweat equity by musicians for musicians. Go to smallpondstudios.io to reach out to get more information. And make sure you let them know that Brute sent you. Hey, Sound Guy Ryan here. Didn't know if you heard, but we're a part of the Hopped Up Network. There you'll find other informative podcasts about beer. So go ahead, follow them on social media, and visit them on their website, hoppedupnetwork.com, to learn more about the people, beer, and breweries from around the country. And until next time, thanks for listening. Cheers. So Chelsea, I'm sure that you have a hand in developing, not developing new recipes, but assisting, well, researching, yeah, res and, researching and assisting yeah. the final product that's out there. But to me, that sounds like a band of all stars trying to decide, <laughs> like, this is the best song in the world, and we all have to agree that this is the best song in the world. Um, how do you guys meet and make this decision <laughs> that this beer should go to market? And have you been that? Um, that lone juror that's like this beer <laughs> sucks and then everyone else agrees with you after 12 hours or doesn't, or doesn't yeah. um yeah so we have an entire r&d team actually um so we have an r&d brewer and then a lot of our r&d is done um at our small brewery in venice beach called the propagator um so that's a whole team that i'm sort of tangentially involved with but i'm not necessarily calling the shots yeah. <laughs> by any means. Um, so the way that sensory plays into it is basically as they are brewing um, kind of recipe test batches, 
we will either taste the beer in the descriptive panel, which is the subgroup of sensory panel. Um, we've even done consumer trials where we brought in like a focus group of people to taste the product here on site. Hmm. Um, there's kind of a lot of different angles of it. Uh, we've done triangle tests to see whether people prefer one iteration or another. Yep. Um, there's a lot of different ways we've solicited feedback, both from our tasting panel and just from broader uh, markets, basically. So what is the um, description panel that you've mentioned a few times now? Yeah, so the description panel, I believe there are 10 of us on it, um, and it's a whole mixture of employees, and people are selected for the group based on um, their attendance and panel, their performance and panel, because we do a lot of trainings and tests, so you get to know which panelists are better than others at picking out <laughs> off flavors and distinguishing yeah. different beers. Yeah. Um, so we meet once a week and it's a really great group of people, great palettes. Um, I think the most fun part for me is just when you're in a round table tasting environment, you know, you have one way that you perceive the beer, but it's always really fun to hear other people's impressions. So, you know, we were tasting this, uh, beer wine hybrid and everyone's talking about the the grape aromas and things along those lines and then someone else said i'm just getting butter on white bread <laughs> and so everyone's like hmm and they re-swirl their glass and they sniff and they're like oh yeah you're right totally butter on white bread yeah yeah now <laughs> how much funny. of that do you think is like a mind over matter yeah, situation like, like oh, I taste Sprite, and everyone's like, oh, yeah, Sprite, <laughs> you're a genius. <laughs> well, we don't always all agree, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of it is definitely the power of suggestion. That's one reason why when we are, for example, um, profiling a new product, so that's one thing that we'll do in the descriptive panel and also in regular sensory panel is we give a sample of the beer to the taster, and they get a list of every possible common flavor attribute and then you just check off everything that's there and i feel like that's a pretty different experience to have the list of flavors in front of you and pick from that than to just sit there with nothing in front of you and try to pull out of thin air like for oh, sure it smells like grapefruit I yeah. mean. <laughs> so i definitely take the time to always think about every attribute you know it's like does it have mango no melon yes pineapple Yes. Oh, yeah. God. <laughs> that is so, a lot. It, it, takes, it takes some time to, to really thoroughly assess a beer, but it's pretty neat to see the things that you can find in it once for you go sure. looking. Yeah. For now, sure. How much does this transfer over into food for you? Does this transfer at all? Like, are you like, <laughs> are you uh, also a you food like, snob? <laughs> yeah. Are you like, oh, I had this amazing pasta, and they're like, oh, it's a secret recipe. And you're like, oh, I know that you put butter in it, like, or something <laughs> like, like, yeah, I think it definitely carries over to food. And I think that um, learning to identify and be really descriptive about food flavors is really useful for developing your palate for beer, too. Um, we talk about trying to be as specific as possible with flavors, like rather than just saying it's citrusy. Well, is it orange or lemon? And is it a regular orange or a tangerine? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so, even with food, you're always trying to just get better at really narrowing down exactly what it is that you're smelling and tasting. Yeah, it's interesting. It would be so interesting to see if the smaller breweries were to have people like yourselves working there, how the descriptions of their beer would change. You know, you might have, like you mentioned, like, oh, this it's citrusy, but There's lime is a citrus. <laughs> and, yeah, right, yeah. right. Um, how much do you guys impact the description of beer? Um is it as far as the terminology that like marketing is? Yeah, going to use? exactly. Uh, huge impact. So one thing that we struggle with at Firestone is that because we're on such a large scale, our marketing materials have to be created far in advance in order oh, to get the can artwork and everything like that yeah. approved. The you can't do it like the day before. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, you know, since we're not just printing our own stickers and putting them on 16 ounce cans like on the line. <laughs> We have to plan stuff way in advance. Um, so it's definitely a combo. Some of the um, like can art and things like that will be decided long before we've actually brewed the beer. <laughs> um, yeah. But when it comes to, so, you know, when you see like juicy, hazy, 
tropical on a can of mine haze. That was determined in a marketing setting long before we actually made the beer. Oh, but then if you were to come to our tap room or go to our website and read the more in-depth descriptions about the mouthfeel and the aromas, mm. that's all coming out of the sensory panel. Yeah. Gotcha. We see a lot of beer being done with milk sugar right now. <laughs> and that giving a, that milk, that mouthfeel. Mouthfeel. Yeah. yeah. Um, has that been with new styles of beer coming out? Has that had to be like a new mouthfeel that you guys come up with terms for it? Or like, what is it, you know? Um, I don't feel that we've had to do too much adjustment to our lexicon with the mouthfeel component of it. Um, we are always adjusting our lexicon to make sure that it's including all of the most common characteristics in our beers. So for example, like melon and mango were something that we added recently to our lexicon because we hadn't really brewed so many beers that had that flavor. But now that tropical Southern hemisphere hops are super popular. Yep. Yeah. yeah we definitely had to make that adjustment. All right, Chelsea. So what do you want us and our listeners to know more about sensory and everything that's out there so they can be more informed to be our drinkers? I think one thing that people forget about is that for a good quality beer experience, you are going to benefit most from selecting a beer that is going to be super fresh. And I always just look for whatever the local selection is. Um, you know, it's easy to get caught up in trend chasing or <laughs> looking for specific styles. For sure. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love a good hype can. But, uh, <laughs> you know, like I couldn't say necessarily that I have a go-to style because I'm always just going to be trying to pick out whatever is done best by the brewery that I'm at or in the area that I'm visiting back when people could still travel. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think you have a good point. I mean, the bre beer that's brewed locally is probably going to be the freshest, right? So yeah. that's kind of what you probably should go for. Support local. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and super random. I'm, I'm pretty sure I know the question to this the or answer. the answer to this. <laughs> the <qu> right. <laughs> um, drinking beer out of a can versus a glass thoughts. It's definitely going to impact your tasting experience. Okay. Um, by pouring it into a glass, you are allowing a lot of the flavors to escape into the um, headspace of the glass, and it's going to be easier to pick up those aromas. When you're drinking straight out of the can or the bottle, it's pretty much the same as if you were drinking with your nose plugged. Um, Ooh, so you're missing gotcha. out on a lot of that experience. And so that's actually a Tell fun Hedy question. Tell Hedy Chopper that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny that you mentioned that because I think a lot of people, when they first try craft beer, um, they're not having the best first impression of it because they're drinking it straight out of the can or out of the bottle. And yeah. so this is where that um, retronasal impact comes in because you're not really smelling that beer until you're exhaling after swallowing it. And so you're going to have this really warped perception of what it smells like. Um, you're just going to be getting a lot of the bitterness without a lot of the fruitier or floral aromas. So I think um, it actually gives people an unfair <laughs> impression of craft beer <laughs> if they don't drink it out of a glass. So definitely drink out of a glass if you can. This whole ritual nasal thing is something we're going to have to practice. We're going to have to try it. We yeah. just gotta, we're just going to do it every time. Take a video. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, your your palate changes when you eat some food with beer. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're doing these sensory panels, obviously just... What are you using as a palate cleanser? Just water or? And do you fast like for hours beforehand? <laughs> <laughs> we ask panelists not to eat for 30 minutes before coming oh, to panel. That's not bad. Uh, I could do it. I think I could control food. myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so an important thing we should talk about actually is panel snacks. So <sighs> panel snacks. You, you're supposed to not eat right before you come to panel. But uh, one thing that we use to lure people to come to panel besides just the glory of becoming a great taster is that you also get to leave with a snack. Yay. So a fun size Snickers, a little bag of potato chips. It's like getting, <laughs> it's like donating blood, right? Yeah. Yes. You get a cookie at the end. I love that part. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So that's, that's actually kind of a legendary thing in sensory sciences. You've got to have a good snack selection to get the panelists in. <laughs> That's For awesome. me, I would just be like, oh, I get to try beer? Sign me up. <laughs> right? 
but the snack's definitely a bonus. Yeah. <laughs> what do you suggest? I mean, I assume like eating plain crackers and water throughout a sensory session. If yeah, you need. we actually used to do saltines during panel and we don't any longer. Okay. Uh, but we do definitely advise rinsing thoroughly with water between samples yeah. because you can definitely get flavor carryover that will really impact how you're perceiving, perceiving samples. Um, it's kind of funny. So we will intentionally spike beers in panel, but not tell people. Yeah. And we're just doing it to kind of make sure that they're Surprise. on their toes. <laughs> yeah. Make sure that they're being thorough. And it's also good practice because then you have a chance to know like, oh, that was a papery spike in that beer and I missed it. So yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing that I've seen if people don't rinse thoroughly between samples is they'll experience carryover and they'll mark the wrong sample. So for example, with metallic as a spike, um, that's one that you won't be able to smell. You won't know that it's in the beer until the retro nasal <laughs> you guys need a soundboard with like a ping. we really do yeah, yeah. Ping, <laughs> retro nasal <laughs> so you won't perceive metallic until the retro nasal and if you don't rinse thoroughly you can actually not notice it until the next sample and so i've seen people do that it's like it's in sample number three but they marked on sample number four because they still had it in their mouth Oh my god! I might be retrograding, retro, retro, <laughs> retro, <laughs> really? my like fourth beer. <laughs> yeah. um, you mentioned earlier in the interview about proper glassware, and um, I think we always see people drinking the wrong beer out of the wrong glassware. And I guess in our environment, we see people just drinking out of whatever the coolest cup is. Sometimes, um, yeah. How but, much does that matter? Yeah. How much does it matter? Yeah. Um, I really do love the trend of ridiculous beer glasses. My, <laughs> yes. my favorite ridiculous beer glass is one that Omnipolo uses that's like baby faces. Oh, my uh, God. Yeah. I don't know if I've seen that one. I have, no, yeah. Omnipolo baby chalice, and you'll see it. Um, okay. It's so They're like sculpted in the glass. Um, so, you know, there's definitely different schools of thought. I think that there is a really solid argument to be had for – the general concept of glass shape affecting your perception. I don't think it's necessarily as critical to have like Belgian style where they have the branded glass right. for that exact year. Right. I think that's a little excessive, um, but you will definitely notice a flavor impact. Um, you know, if you were to pour the same beer into just like a straight sided juice glass and then into a tulip, um, you'll notice that the tulip is going to do a better job of the aromas and things, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think the most important thing isn't even so much the glass shape, but the cleanliness of it. Yeah. Um, beer clean glasses, it's a big topic in like the Cicerone world, but it is a real thing that, you know, you don't want to go to a, a bar and be served a beer where it's got bubbles clinging all over the side of the glass. <laughs> totally agree. You are allowed to send that beer back. Cause that <laughs> yeah. glass ain't clean. Gross. Yeah. <laughs> it's to be flat faster. Yeah. Um, Gross. Who knows what kind of flavors were in it before they put your beer in it. Right. Yeah. So, right. I mean, it's definitely important. Yeah. So Chelsea, I'm curious, uh, what are you drinking at home with the, you know, your expanded taste palette? Do you have, um, <laughs> Only the freshest beer. Only draft beer at home. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing canned. Um, Well, I definitely drink a lot of Firestone Walker. No (laughs) surprise there. Uh, Mind Haze is my go-to Firestone beer. Um, It's our, you know, juicy, hazy IPA. Um, When I'm not drinking Firestone beer, again, I tend to go for whatever is going to be the freshest or most specialized thing um, wherever I'm visiting. This time of year, um, since it's hop harvest time, I'd like to go off for a moment about how amazing hop harvest is. Yes. <laughs> so, Please. So, so Eric and I connected on the like social app that was connected to YCH virtual hop harvest. Mm-hmm. Um, and being originally from Washington state, um, fresh hop season is like Christmas to me. Um, it's not pumpkin beer season to me, it's, <laughs> it's fresh hop. Um, so for people that aren't aware, which is a lot of people, unfortunately, a fresh yep. hop IPA is not just an IPA that was brewed recently. It is a totally different sub style of IPA where they are using hops that are straight from the field that have not been dried or kilned. So it's, to me, it's like the difference between making a mojito with fresh mint versus if you made it with like 
mint, mint extract or something. Yeah. A bag, yeah. 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 A mojito in a bag. So, yeah. It's going to have like a really different, um, super fresh, super green flavor f- profile. It's also fun that it's such a limited time of year. Yeah. Because the brewers are picking up their hops and getting them in the kettle within 24 hours of it being picked off the vine. So, yeah, it's crazy. It's a once a year beer. Yeah. Like you yeah. said, it's like Christmas. It's it's super exciting. <laughs> Yeah. So unfortunately in California, a lot of people have not caught on yet, um, but I was able to find a fresh hop IPA recently. Um, I went to the tap room of Alvarado street. They have a tap room down in Santa Barbara and they also have a brewery in Portland. So it was one of their Portland, Oregon beers. Nice. Nice. It was a strata fresh hop IPA. Oh, Oh, I don't really have a strata one before. That's pretty cool. That's because we don't, get that we beer really yeah we don't get that, get that, that hop right yeah, okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. So often unless it's dried <laughs> right right um i know you mentioned that you don't have a particular beer style that you prefer but do you do you <laughs> but do you really <laughs> but do you really <laughs> yeah. i mean like 90 percent of the time i'm probably going to be drinking an ipa um okay there's not really any styles that i dislike uh pretty much the only flavor profile that i don't enjoy in beverages at all is smoky um i don't like scotch i don't like all and i don't like smoky beer interesting huh. yeah i like smoked, yeah like smoke <laughs> lagers facts. i love those <laughs> yeah um, but i love wild and funky beers um flanders red ale is kind of mm, a style so that, good um, you know it's not done commonly and it's not necessarily always done well but when it is done well it's really delicious yeah, yeah. But i'm always on the lookout for something unusual like that cool definitely uh, guilty pleasure beers. You have any uh, like? No, I'm not ashamed of any gross <laughs> beers that I make. Like, <laughs> um, I mean, I drink a seltzer now and then. Ooh, I know that's yeah. controversial. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. We love them here too. Yeah. Now we'll admit it. <laughs> are you guys getting into the seltzer game? And what does that sensory look like for you? Um, no, I don't believe that we have any intention of becoming blah, blah. a seltzer. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, that actually is a pretty unknown world to me. I know that, um, so Aroxa, the company that makes a lot of the flavor standards that we use for beer sensory, they do make flavor standards for water, for cider, for soft drinks. For wow. water? So, That's crazy. Yeah. Imagine so being I, that person that has yeah, to, like, water. Is, oh, right? my God. <laughs> this water is bad. <laughs> I can't try your tap water. I guess, like, you're looking for chlorine or different minerals, I guess. right? yeah. That's I next level. Confess. I am kind of a water snob. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really sensitive to chlorophenol, which is the the smell of chlorine and water. Yep. <laughs> so we actually do run our water through sensory panel as well. <sighs> we um, can't take her anywhere. Yeah, yeah, really can't. <laughs> oh, yeah we, we taste our our brewing water here just to make sure that there's nothing off in it. That's yeah, cool. That's really cool. It's interesting to hear what a big scale brewery does because I think oftentimes we don't we we actually not oftentimes we don't look at this side of brewing we just assume that the beer that we're getting is the most wonderful thing in the world and it tastes wonderful i also wonder i think a lot of small breweries don't have like a sensory panel set up yet you know um but i assume that's something that you would recommend for all breweries definitely um it was really valuable to get off flavor training when i was working at bear bottle in the tap room and they were a much smaller brewery, yeah. so definitely recommend it if it's within your budget and your scope. Get as much training for your staff, everyone from brewers to tap room. Um, just there's really no downside to it to having a more educated staff. Yeah, so. yeah. If yeah. you have the resources. And it sounds like you guys are making it easy for some of our brewery friends to learn that with some of the suggestions you're making on that 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 blog that you guys mentioned. Yeah, no, definitely. We'll, we'll definitely repost that. Yeah. Um, okay. if there's one thing that a smaller brewery that is being, uh, conscious about their, their pay, um, not their pay, but conscious about budget, their money. Yeah, yeah, their budget, money yeah. Their, um, what is one thing that they can do to improve their uh, sensory and, 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 QC? and their beer? Yeah. yeah. I think just having good SOPs in place, I mean, it doesn't cost anything to have an organized system for when and how often you're tasting your product and comparing it against previous batches and just having those checks in place. Even if you're not spending a lot of money on training materials, you can still just get a 
core group of people into the groove of tasting the same beer all the time. Hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of just repetition. Yeah. And I'm sorry, let's dumb it down one more step. What does SOP mean? What's sorry. It for? <laughs> Standard operating procedure. Oh, okay. Yeah. I totally knew that. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically just, you know, your, your guidelines that you write up for how you're going to release a beer. To know that it's past your quality specifications. Mm. Gotcha. So, Chelsea, I want people to, I mean, if you don't know, Firestone Walker, yeah, just use the Google. You might yeah, live yeah. on a rock. Um, but <laughs> um, we want people to, uh, at a safe social distance at, at this time, uh, patronize the tap room if they're able to. And find you guys on social media and the website so they can go to that awesome link that we will include in the doobly blue below. Huh. Whatever it's called. That was almost as good as you usually do it. Doobly do. Doobly do. Below. <laughs> yeah. So our website is firestonebeer.com. We have tap rooms in Paso Robles, California, which is where I'm speaking to you from right now. Woo-hoo. That's where our main brewery has been located since 2000. Um, we also have our small batch brewery in Venice Beach called The Propagator. And then we have a third tap room, which is at our sour beer facility called Barrel Works, which is in Buellton, California, which is basically between here and L.A. Wow. Nice. And we've got retail, restaurant at all those locations. Um, they're open right now. <laughs> yep. And go visit. But... Yeah. And then on social, you guys are on all social medias. Under Firestone yep. Walker, yep. probably. Firestone Walker. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Do you got one last question, Erica? Oh, I think I have one last question. I always would like to ask all of our amazing interviewees. Guests. Yeah, guests. Friends. There we go. Guests, friends. <laughs> Lifelong friends. <laughs> Lifelong best friends, besties. Um, <laughs> what are you uh, most proud of? I am just honored to be part of this team every day. Um, it is honestly really magical to work at such a high quality brewery. And I'm not just saying that because I work here. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm honestly really proud of the beer that we release. Um, there has never been a beer that has left the sensory department that I thought was not the best thing that we could be giving to the public at that time. So we just care a lot about consistency and just having really good high quality drinkable beer. And the people that work here are all really awesome. It's a really fun team and they're so smart and <laughs> I learn so much every day. Yay. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Chelsea, cool. take care and stay safe out there. Thank you. You too. All right. Cheers. 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 All right. Well, thank you, everyone who made it this far. If you've made it this far, you know that our equipment did not get ruined for me dropping a beer during recording. Right? Right. Yeah, it's fine. It's right? fine. It's fine. Ryan is so mad at me. He has not stopped staring at me the whole time in anger. Maybe it's because he loves you. I think it's because he's really <laughs> mad that I dropped a beer. I am very mad. He's very mad. Uh, but thank you to Chelsea, who took the time out of her day to do this. Uh, awesome episode. I learned a ton. Uh, I think Eric and Ryan, you guys learn anything? Absolutely. Totes. Totes. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, continue to support uh, Mass Beer, New England Beer. Um, and if you are listening, uh, you know, throughout the the world or wherever you're listening, uh, support your local brewery because, you know, uh, we are hearing every day of new breweries that are closing. And, uh, and opening. And opening. So continue to support the new ones, the old ones. And uh, if you haven't been to one in a while, go there and uh, support. Support. Yeah. Uh, sound guy Ryan, we have an awesome episode, right? Yep. That's right. I don't want Erica, what's the episode? Can't tell you because you haven't made the new schedule yet. That's right. It needs to go on <laughs> social media. So follow us on social media to find out what episodes we are releasing next. And until next time. Cheers. Cheers. No, no, just do the outro. <laughs> just do the fucking outro. <laughs> Oh my god, there's so much pressure. <laughs> it is not St. Patrick's Day. It's not even fucking Valentine's Day. Just do the outro. <laughs> <laughs>